Okay. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce today's speaker, Shreshko Joksimovic, who is a senior, uh, a senior lecturer at the University of South Australia in Adelaide. Um, and I really feel lucky that I got an opportunity to meet Shreshko, I think, I don't know how many years ago now, at a, a Summer Institute for Learning Analytics in Michigan, um, which were, where we first started talking about um, trying to bring together SNA and ENA. And I learned a ton from him. Uh, through that process, and I'm really hoping that you all will get a chance to learn a ton from him as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand things off um, to let Shreshko talk about kind of where SNA and ENA intersect. Take it away, Shreshko. Thanks, Brendan. As I, as I said before we started the whole the, the, the meeting, I, I'm really happy to be here to see you all here again. It's been a while since we started all this discussion, and I think we should pick up some of that sometime soon. And uh, it, um, it might be uh, a bit unfortunate because this presentation, I guess, is coming in uh, not such a good time for me. It's, uh, it's Friday and it's early morning. But <laughs> besides that, it's, uh, I'm still having a lot of questions other than answers. So let's see how that's going to go from here. And can you see my slides, uh, Brendan? OK, good. So um, let me see if this is going to start moving. Yep. So I will try to uh, give a little bit of the background why we actually, why we're doing social and uh, then again epistemic network analysis and how we try to combine these two, uh, I would say complementary perspectives into one analytical model. And uh, it might not be clear, but yes, connectivism has something to do with this. And I'll try to talk a little bit about uh, how I see the role of connectivism in the whole discussion and where we can take this discussion from here. Um, when I talk about ENA, uh, I, I'll be using uh, ENA and quant quantitative ethnography uh, as, as a synonym, pretty much, which I know it's not the right thing to do, but that's somehow, th that's what came to the to the all this analysis. So, um, as Brendan already said, I'm, uh, I'm a senior lecturer in data science here at you know, Australia, University of South Australia, working with a uh, really good group of people with George, Shane, Vita, Sasha, Rebecca, I think is here, and a few more colleagues who are really, um, really amazing to work with. Uh, my background is in computer science, but I did my PhD in, uh, in a school of education, University of Edinburgh. That's where, I think that's where, where David and I met, uh, met uh, and started the whole discussion about the, the DNA. And um, my research currently focuses on understanding the abilities of both groups and individuals to develop necessary, necessary skills and competencies for solving complex real world problems. And I see DNA and quantitative, quantitative ethnography playing a really important role in the whole, um, in, 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 in my research domain. So why? why we talk about networks at all. So um, knowledge is networked, right? So whenever we engage in the learning something, we engage with the network elements that space across the, the, the centuries. And knowledge is also distributed across a range of people and resources. Being able to build a plane, for example, requires connected expertise from more than one individual and um, each of them having distinct, distinct knowledge. So it's actually, uh, really difficult to, to integrate those different perspectives into single, uh, single one when we are trying to solve some of those complex problems. Distributed cognition on, on, on one hand treats knowledge as, as existing within a network of art, artifacts and human actors. But cognitive agents that we are facing now and that we will be facing more and more are sli slightly, well, a lot, a lot, lot different because the, the agents we have nowadays and that we will be facing more and more have more active impact on our actions as, as, as non-human actors in human knowledge network. And that's, that's something that's really new. And what I forgot to say at the beginning, please feel free to, to interrupt in any, any time. And um, I'm happy to jump in and answer some of the questions and uh, if something is not clear. Um, So why we are doing social network analysis? And uh, as you will see, 
social network analysis started, the whole research starting a long time ago. And the, 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 usually what goes with uh, this, uh, this approach is it's not what do you know, it's who do you know and who you interact with, which especially becomes important in, the, in this age when we all learn online and we, when the connection with other um, people is, is, is seamless and easier than they ever have, have been. So the history of social network analysis dates back to 1930s with Harvard study that analyzed interpersonal relations and the formation of cliques. At the time, there were a few more groups that uh, started something similar, but this one, this, was, uh, this one was one of the most uh, popular at the time. Then in 1940s, we, we saw that social centrality was first introduced, while social network analysis received significant uptake in 1950s and 1960s. Freeman, in his seminal work in 1979, revises the concepts of centrality, and then we have in 1980s and 1990s, Ganovetter and Brooke Burt introducing their seminal work that actually shaped the whole research on social network analysis as we know it today. Of course, with emergence of social media and new technology and uh, development of learning analytics, we had more uptake, especially of, um, of um, uh, social network analysis as a method for, for understanding learning and um, and it, it became really one of the cornerstones of learning analytics research. And one of the, uh, some of the first uh, papers published on learning analytics connect to, to, to social network analysis. It allows us basically, what, what SNA allows us to do is to move from the understanding how individuals learn and what individuals do to take that more comprehensive understanding of how groups interact and how we interact with others to, to, um, to build knowledge and to learn. In educational research, what we've seen before is that most of the time we rely on understanding how structural positioning, how those centrality um, uh, measures can help us predict some kind of cognitive learning outcomes, whether these being final course grade or quiz assignment, or quiz scores or something like that. It helps us understand high sense of belonging, how uh, social positioning is, uh, relates to the core satisfaction, and, and uh, some of the work uh, talks to comprehension of learning materials and, uh, and social network position. So what I'm going to do, I will just briefly uh, uh, guide you through some of the work in, in social network analysis and show you how we moved from that descriptive network analysis to something that's more complex and uh, how, how that research around social networks actually evolved through, through, through educational research and specifically through learning analytics research. Uh, some time ago, Dragon and Amal said, be careful who you hang out with and who your classmates are because it might uh, influence your, your GPA. What these studies showed, and it, they analyzed 10 years of student core enrollment networks in a master's degree program in, in Canada, so what they show is basically the student social capital accumulated to, to their course progression is positively associated with their academic performance. So those who had more social capital and, um, and who had more connections, they tend to, to have significantly higher performance. But in that sense, um, it was also important whether you're connecting with those who are high performing students or, or, or low performing students. In this sense, um, uh, they, uh, they, um, operationalize this notion of social capital to different uh, measures of, uh, of uh, social centrality. And it seemed it, what came as the most prominent uh, its uh, uh, finding is, was basically, it's not just that you know a lot of people, but it's more about knowing those who know a lot of people. And, uh, and um, it was really interesting and one of the first studies in, 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 that, um, in that area. What we did on a slightly different uh, uh, front, we tried to understand building on the notion, and this is where first gonna touch base on, on touch on connectivism, uh, to understand how um, roles of course facilitators, learners and technology might have, uh, uh, might, might shape the flow of inf information in a, in a, in a connectivist MOOC. So 
the, some of the assumptions of connectivism say that at the beginning there will be chaos. Well, if George defines something, you, you would find that quite normal. And then as the course progresses, they will, those knowledgeable others will emerge and they will drive discussion. So we try to rely on, on uh, methods of social, social network analysis to, to show that this teaching function becomes di distributed across the, among the influential actors in the network. And as the course progressed, both human and technological actors comprising the network subsumed this teaching function and had an influence on how network developed. And this was different across different social media because uh, in, in Connective Smook, you, you're not tied to one specific platform, but it was more about uh, how you engage with others through Twitter, how you engage with others through, through blogs and, and so on. So, it was also interesting that those official course facilitators preserved this high level of influence over the flow of information, but over time, few groups emerged that were, that were actually connected around uh, different, um, different topics that, that, that they were interested in. However, if you take a deeper look, and that's what those three studies that somehow appeared at the same time and at the same conference, and arguing for the same same uh, direction uh, of uh, how uh, SNA research, research should evolve. SNA research is not very conclusive, so you can't really say that uh, higher degree centrality will always pre be associated with higher uh, with better outcomes or any other centrality. The thing is, and what we try to do to some extent across all those studies and these are different research groups. Shane was common across the two, I think. Uh, we tried to understand, is there anything else actually that, uh, that uh, might, be, uh, might have an impact on how the, the next networks form and how, what, what else is there that actually helps us understand when different centrality measures might be associated with, uh, with uh, better outcomes and when mi that might not be the case. So what we did basically in all those studies, we relied on statistical network analysis. So this is the, the first shift that happened basically from descriptive, and when I say descriptive, it's about understanding different uh, centrality properties, centra uh, different indicators of, of uh, how well we are connected within a certain network and how that predicts certain elements, certain outcomes of interest. But here we are shifting a bit further from this descriptive analysis trying to, to get that uh, statistical network analysis on, on, on top, of the, on top of, the, of the network analysis to try to shape the, the, the narrative around when different the, the centrality measures might actually be predictive of the outcome and when they might not be. So what we did in, in our work, basically we linked uh, this, um, those interactions to Similia and Thai's theory that basically says that being a central node in a network is not always associated with higher outcomes. Sometimes if you're, if you're bridging across the, across the entirely connected clicks, you might not benefit because you're never gonna connect these two uh, totally opposite, opposite net, networks. So basically the, the underlying uh, findings from those studies that the relationship between social connectivity, performance and engagement is not really stable over time. And what else is important is the difference is the factors framing learners interactions affect the association between the social centrality and different measures of, of performance. So we tried to make that shift from descriptive to, um, to statistical network analysis to uh, gain more significant insights into how the dynamics of networks actually, actually uh, shape the, 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 the social interactions. But then, like that wasn't enough, Sasha came and said, well, well wait, there is something wrong here. So all the, all the uh, statistical network models built on the generative models that come from uh, our understanding of social relations, how people communicate, how they talk to each other. But in being in online space, and that's where SNA has been applied more commonly with the emergence of, of, of learning management systems and social media and other technology, is this still the same? Network, network, uh, network learning as a, as a broad um, field of research says that basically that in this 
digital environment, we appear through language, language and discourse. So what we say, the artifacts we produce, that's basically what's shaping, uh, uh, what actually presents us in this online environment. But the, 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 um, the fact is that I'm not interacting with Brendan anymore. I'm interacting with the artifacts Brendan produced, whether that's, that's a, a, a discussion forum posts or, or, or some other uh, forum or artifact, but still the, the nature of this interaction might be, might be different. So what was the, the main argument be, behind the, the, the work Sasha did with uh, uh, her colleagues? is that most of the time what we do when we model interactions in online settings is that we try to understand who talks to whom and to project uh, and to build a network in, the, in a sense, I replied to this person. But as a matter of fact, that's not what actually happened. I replied to this particular post. And the, the, this second example actually shows that approach suggested in this study, what they say, they say, let's try to model network as a forum based using forum based modeling approach rather than modeling relation between people they suggest using post to post activity as the network to be simulated so what we can do then we can randomize ties in the post to post network based on why learners post on the forum and what would be the more representative of how and why online interactions actually happen in this approach this approach still allows them to to uh, look at learner learner ties but not as being simulated once, but as projected from the random network of posting behavior. So to cut a, cut a, cut a long uh, story short, the suggestion is to simulate basic networks using hypotheses about learning behavior in socio-technical systems, rather than social relations, relations between people, because there might be some differences. What happened, what they, what they found in, in this study, and that was particularly interesting is, the degree appears to be an artifact of learning activity. So most of the time you will see that uh, one of the dimensions we try to capture modeling the, the, the social network, networks from discussion forum post degree centrality. But basically, if you, if you have more discussion forum post, it's highly likely that you will have more, more um, higher degree, of course. And uh, the argument they made here is that perhaps degree centrality on its own can't be really used as a measure of social capital, but rather as, a, as, a, as a some kind of, of proxy of the, of the learn, learning activity. On the other hand, weighted clustering coefficient and the, 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 the notion who do we talk to and how we tend to group within the different uh, cohorts may be related to social behavior. So although our, our posting behavior uh, relates specifically to learning activities and what we are asked to do in a specific context of a course or uh, wherever you're learning, this tendency to cluster with, with, uh, with uh, other colleagues uh, still might come from the underlying assumptions developed from social behavior. So what seems to be the case, we, it seems like we need more generative models for network formation that are based on our understanding of how socio-technical digital learning uh, uh, systems work rather than something that you just uh, took over from from social behavior and, and other other sciences and translated into these new settings. If you don't know this quote where this comes comes from, then you never saw that video on on quantitative ethnography, and you should take a look at it. So, ENA, as a complementary perspective, is novel, is graph based, is method in, in social sciences, I would say, uh, research in general, and more specifically, a uh, really useful method in learning analytics research. And it allows us to identify and quantify connections among the elements in coded data and representing them in the dyna dynamic network models. So it's not just that, so what I find really, really uh, important about quantitative, quantitative ethnography and epistemic network analysis in, in particular is, it's not that just you, that you can just uh, understand the, the visualize the relationship between different elements. It's you can also quantify all, all those um, relationships with with uh, using different statistical methods. And uh, it's it's somehow it's natural. I don't like talking about uh, mixed methods or quantitative methods or qualitative methods. To me, it's more like what kind of questions you're trying to solve. 
it's not really, you know, I don't care about what kind of method you're gonna use, but most of the problems you're trying to solve nowadays require that cross-disciplinary approach, require, uh, I would say, um, uh, I lost the word, but the comprehensive perspective that would integrate both worlds. If we, if we talk about quantity, quantity, we can't understand nowadays problems using just one perspective. And DNA is really good in, in going across, across different perspectives. So I will guide you to, uh, to a few of the, uh, of the studies that we, that we did. I think we were good with the time. Um, that we did use the epistemic network analysis, what kind of insights ENA on its own allows us to gain from some of the, some of the work we did. And these, I think I will have two studies that are slightly different and use different, different data sources. So for example, we all know that learning analytic, analytics dashboards are becoming more and more popular in, in, uh, as a way to provide students with personalized feedback. What we don't know is basically how students uh, interpret those dashboards and how they make sense of all the information that we push back to them. And uh, I have to take, say thank you, Lisa, for this really amazing work. This was really interesting, interesting study. And uh, so what we tried to do uh, is basically we employed randomized control trials to examine student sense making of learning analytics dashboard, showing four different frames of reference and to what extent uh, this um, impact of dashboards was mediated by baseline self-regulation. The study basically used think aloud protocols to capture how students make sense of four different dashboards with different frame of, of reference. And when I say frame of reference, th that means that there were four dashboards. One of them was self-referenced. This dashboard comprised graphic displaying individuals' total time spent on different learning activities. Then there was course reference so information shown uh, on this dashboard was uh, basically supported also by course recommendation, time, how much time you should be spending on different activities. Then peer reference, referenced in, in a sense like, this is where you are, this is where your peers are. And the last one was, I guess, most complex course and peer reference showing you the information basically um, where do you stand in uh, relation to the course recommendation and in relation with where, where your peers uh, might be standing. So ENA in this case was used for modeling the association between the codes describing the reason for paying attention to specific graphics in, in the da dashboard, affective responses to dashboards and actions to take in response to, to seeing the different, different types of dashboards and, of, and the motivation uh, change after seeing performance data. So what was interesting here is that, and I hope George will hear this, negative affect is not bad. Negative affect is not bad. So it's not necessarily adverse to student SRL. Sometimes across all those dashboards, we can see the strong link between uh, negative affect and time and study environment management and different graphical aspects of the dashboards. And it depends, if we talk about self-reference uh, reference dashboards, students ten, tend to uh, think more about whether the graphic provides clear trend, how I'm progressing throughout the course. If we talk about course reference dashboards, then it's more about um, um, just linking the, the, <clears throat> the negative affect and, and time management. But when it comes to peers is also, can we break down? Can we drill down? Can we, uh, can we get that comparison across different with different, uh, with, uh, with our peers. And uh, the last one, the most complex one was basically how those visual uh, features allow us to, to um, can we easily understand the features that the, the, the dashboard represent? So that was one example. Another one, so, and this one was using think aloud, aloud protocols. What we did, we coded uh, data, we found, uh, according to different uh, theoretical frameworks, but the, the, the next one is, and that's, that's, I guess, the most commonly way to use uh, ENA and quantitative quantity ethnography in general. But the other one was, was somewhat different because what we did here, we had a context where professional, um, healthcare professionals 
engage in, in, uh, in professional development. So at the end of the series of three courses, three modules, A, B, and C, how they, they, they label them, uh, they would take high stake applied knowledge test. And in this cohort, we had most of them passing the test, but some of them failed. And given how important this test was, it was important to understand what are some of those underlying um, principles or mechanisms that we can identify from the interactions that could tell us that some of them will pass or, or, or fail the test at the end. A lot of interactions, three modules, and what we observed here was, um, I think I could show you, the, yeah, I have this as well. We looked learners within specific session and what are the activities they were, uh, they were, um, they were, they were, they were taking within the specific session, whether they were assessing, accessing uh, uh, learning resources, whether they are trying some assessment, whether they were submitting some uh, written artifacts and so on. Of course, when we, uh, when we uh, tried to fit ENA, this part on, uh, on course group uh, activities was actually turned into the columns. So that's how we approached the whole thing. So what, what, uh, what we were able to find out is that those who, yeah, what, what's important as well, what I forgot to mention in the previous slide, those first two modules, A and B, they focus on learning essentials. In those, those two modules, those professionals are expected to cover different learning resources and to read and, and what, uh, view different videos and to submit different critical case analysis. The last module is uh, primarily focused on the analysis, on the, on the, on the assessment. What we found out is that on this um, SVD1 dimension, that's, that's uh, Y axis, right? So we saw that progression and importance of that early engagement with the, with the core, course content. Though who, those who were there from the very beginning who tend to engage with the learning essentials modules to submit those, those critical um, key clinical activities from the very beginning and to engage with the quizzes from the very beginning in, in, in the first six and uh, second six months, they were those who were more successful in the, in, in the final knowledge, knowledge, uh, uh, applied knowledge test. But those who were waiting until the last year and just focused on, on, the, on the activities and exams, they tend to, to fail the test. But basically the whole idea here is like, what, what, what I was trying to show, it's not that you have to, it's not that we just use ENA to analyze data after some inductive coding, after interviews, analyzing that kind of data, we can also uh, generate that uh, we can automatically call data from, from uh, extracted from learning management systems and similar, similar environments. Okay, so we saw one perspective. We, we saw somewhat that something that uh, probably most of you already, already <laughs> knew about, about DNA, but what we tried to do across several studies is to bring those two perspectives together. So, it's not that they just, yeah, they all come from, uh, from uh, graph-based methods, SNA and ENA, and that's what they have in common, but these two perspectives provide complementary insights into, into the problems that we are trying to solve. So the first study that we, that we did was about um, understanding the, the making sense of te teacher agency for change. Agency for change or the, or the capacity to shape critical responses to problematic situation is often framed as a matter of implementing some kind of, of bigger external change agenda. And for example, research has provided useful insights on how teachers exercise agency to implement new national standards, for example. But sometimes teachers might, might also resist this change. So this study that we did examined the association between teachers' sense of agency for change and their underlying beliefs through the lens of, of inclusive pedagogy. So what we did, following the assumptions that change towards more inclusive practices is socially embedded process, we employed a social network analysis to examine the association between teachers' agency, inclusive pedagogy, and their social networks. 
social networks analysis has been applied to understand uh, how this teacher agency shapes the educational change. However, the nature of this change uh, depends on teachers' underlying beliefs and the way of acting that can reinforce or disrupt the, the, existing, the existing norms. So what we did with ENA in this case was to examine teachers' agency in relation to their underlying beliefs and understand of change and the social uh, um, and the social institutional context that shape what teachers see um, see possible uh, within their practice. So how we did this? There was a teacher reflection on their agency for change online tool, where teachers in two schools in Sweden would go and say, "What is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the uh, what is the problem you, you see as uh, as something you you would like to tackle?" or something that someone else asks ask you to solve as a, as a notion of uh, when you play as a role of implementer. Who do you talk to when you try to, to solve this problem? And what is the nature of this relationship? Whether it's uh, seeking for advice, whether it's just uh, collaboration or, or something different. And uh, why uh, providing basically reflection on the outcomes and the context of specific purpose of interaction described in the previous two sections. So again, what we did, we did, um, we coded each of the reflections, trying to find different uh, themes emerging uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, teachers' reflection. And it turns out that, of course, day-to-day -day activities drive changes and what kinds of roles teacher, teachers take in, uh, rather as, as a, as a, um, a genetic approach to, 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 to or, or just as, as a role implementers. So the four themes that we found in, uh, emerging from, from this um, study were student learning and well-being, lesson planning, of course, and professional learning, program improvement and logistics. And the final one was about working conditions. That's just from coding. But what is interesting from the ENA perspective is that the results show significant differences between teachers when acting as agents compared to the situation when teachers are acting uh, as, as role implementers. The epistemic frame from, for, for uh, agency, that's the, 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 the one on, on the left, indicates a strong connection between inclusive pedagogy codes and interactions with teachers. Evidence with those uh, thick lines between school capacity, student capacity, and teacher interaction. On the other hand, teacher logs uh, revealed that practices that hindered any inclusive pedagogical approach appear to be linked to the epistemic frames of, of role implementers. So when we drill down a little bit deeper and uh, try to understand school and student barriers, they were, these were linked more to um, providing some uh, opportunities for smaller group of students rather than implementing uh, inclusive pedagogy across the broad, across the board. Social network analysis, on the other hand, provided a complementary perspective that showed important differences between teachers when acting as agents of change in comparison to teachers' interactions when acting as role implementers. On average, when acting as, uh, as uh, agents, teachers tended to interact with more people in comparison to situations in which they acted as role implementers. Both networks show that teachers and support staff work together frequently when tackling change aimed at students. Many of these interactions are collaborative in, in, a, in a way, while interactions with school leaders are infrequent and focused on either communication or advice. So what we basically did here is that we applied ENA and SNA as, as two complementary approaches, but not necessarily feeding one into the other. It's more of uh, providing two complementary insights on a, on a single problem. What we tried to do some time ago, and uh, this is the study that David, Brendan, Dragon, and, and I um, uh, did some time ago now. So we, what we actually tried is to provide that more seamless link between the two. How one method can feed into the, uh, the other one. And just uh, a heads up, going through to, to, to the next few slides, I won't be 
talking about technical details, I'll, I'll be more focusing on what kind of questions we are trying to answer and how one method feeds into, into the other and what kind of insights we, we were able to, to, to get. So the idea is not just to um, look at a specific problem using one and then the other approach. It was more about, can we actually combine those two analytical methods in something that would, that would give us a uh, more comprehensive understanding of the, of the problem at hand? A fundamental claim for providing more seamless integration between ENA and SNA lies in this necessity to capture the complexity of interactions between interrelated cognitive and social dimensions that emerge from social ties and, and collaborative discourse. We argue that it is difficult to evaluate the quality of collaborative learning by just looking at who is talking to whom without knowing what they're talking about or by modeling what is being said without tracing the interactive contributions of the, of the, of the individual's involvement. And there have been different approaches uh, to, to combine content and, and the social network analysis like Martin Delade uh, back in 2006, 2007, he proposed um, combining um, SNA with content analysis, which, which is more uh, qualitative in a way. This, is, this would be, I guess, one step from there trying to provide that, that uh, more seamless integration between uh, SNA social and, 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 and content analysis or, or epistemic network analysis. So the whole idea is fairly simple or maybe not so simple. Uh, what we did in this study, we started from uh, collaboration traces, uh, specifically analyzing the discourse produced in, 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 those, uh, in, in the, to those collaborations to extract social ties and to um, run some kind of content analysis of the, of the artifacts created in, in those interactions. So when we, when we talk about um, this course, it was, it was fairly simple. We, what we applied was uh, uh, topic modeling and we tried to find, to extract different topics that students uh, were talking about across the course progression. So we applied automated methods for content analysis and run epistemic network analysis on top of that, just to understand what are the topics students talk about and to quantify the relationship between different topics. On the other hand, we try to understand social interactions, uh, modeling social, uh, social relationships emer emerging to these discussion forums and uh, doing social network analysis to extract roles they play in the network, co emerging communities, and to understand network processes that, that drive from formation of these networks. It was quite complex, but at every single step, and that's what I'm try, that I will try to communicate the uh, so next few slides, every question we're trying to ask was somehow a combination of the two methods and how we actually did this. So first question was basically about understanding does what the students talk about influences who they talk who they talk with and how we did this we applied both models one based on sna properties and demographic academic attributes and then another one that traditionally included ena cluster assignments as param parameters of selective mixing so what we actually did we tried to model to use statistical network analysis to to uh, understand the social dynamics that drive network formation. But instead of using uh, simple properties such, such as reciprocity or some of those uh, uh, commonly used, we try to model homophily based on different epistemic uh, clusters emerging from the epistemic network analysis. And that seemed to, to, to give us a um, better model fit than just with, uh, with typical SNA properties. Another thing, is the content of students uh, talk related to their role in a group communication? First thing was about exploring uh, visually how uh, different, different clusters, but then we also compared whether those different ENA clusters were significantly different based on their SNA centrality measures. And here I think we observed three or four weighted degree closeness and, 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 and between us. And it turns out, yes, those, those ENA classes were different uh, with respect to their to different centrality measures. 
And finally, or we might have one more question. Do groups of closely linked students talk about different things depending how well they do in the class? And uh, that's something that, that came across from, from uh, previous SNA studies that students who perform well, they tend to, uh, to group together and they, they tend to talk about similar, uh, similar topics. So what we did first, we ran community detection, SNA, and used that as an input uh, to um, basically to, to, to after running community detection, we identified two, two groups of high performing and low performing learners, and then tried to compare their epistemic, epistemic networks. And finally, we tried to use uh, different SNA and ENA properties in a, in a regression model to try to predict the outcome. Turns out when we combine two, two approaches and, uh, and uh, um, features coming out from, from both analytical methods, we were able to fit better models and to get more insights into the um, into learners' performance. So what about connectivism? How the whole story with, with connectivism fits, uh, fits here? Yeah, I'll try to wrap up this this shortly. Um, as we all know, technology is a central agent in, in all areas of society today, uh, altering uh, the way we communicate, interact and collaborate. Knowledge resides in network. And as we said, as we are moving ahead, it, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not about, yes, knowledge sits somewhere over there. It's more about, um, that those cognitive agents are becoming more active in, in, in the way they interact with humans and in the way they shape our knowledge. Connectivism, on the other hand, recognizes that those three domains of connectedness, or, or, or I don't know the other word, at the biological or neuronal level, at the conceptual and socio-technical level. And here immediately should be clear that a sense as, a, as an approach sits across across these two conceptual and social levels. Some of the principles of connectivism and where I see that those connections with sense, learning and knowledge rest in diversity of opinions. Learning is a process of connecting specialized knowledge of, of information or, or information sources. And capacity to know more is more critical than what is currently known. And I'm not gonna go through, through all those because I think I'm almost running out of time. But what my point here is, ENA and SNA as separate domains, they build on certain theoret theoretical assumptions. There is a theory behind both methods. ENA rests upon the network system of meaning, about understanding uh, the meaning uh, emerge, uh, that, that uh, comes from, let's say, th those interactions. SNA, on the other hand, represents that real connection, the, 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 the connection that actually were established in a, in, a, in, a, in a real world. Connectivism as a framework or learning theory allows us to, to theorize um, those connections creating representations across various levels of systems. At the mental level, social shell meanings and physical uh, objects, artifacts or, te or technological affordances. So as a theory, I think that connectedness sits right under sense in a way of informing how we can utilize this uh, rather uh, uh, interesting combination of SNA and ENA to understand how learning and knowledge processes unfold and how we can uh, understand learning in, in this digital age uh, using, using sense. So basically the argument would be, uh, and ENA and SNA have their own models. Sense should have a different underlying theory that informs research uh, around sense. I tried to go uh, to, to, to show uh, research that comes from SNA and show you how we, um, where we shifted from that, that original research on, on uh, providing some descriptive statistics to more statistical uh, network analysis. We touched briefly on some of the potential of ENA. There is way more to it than, than, than we saw. 
and what I was trying to, to make as an argument is that uh, what I see, how I see ENA going from here and where I see this, uh, this uh, uh, stronger integration between SNA and ENA uh, and, and connectivism as an underlying theory. But what, where actually, where is the main potential of using SENSE? What we say and how we measure, for example, collaboration of uh, collaboration teamwork nowadays. So there are different frameworks out there. Like one of the most, uh, most uh, um, established frameworks on um, assessment and teaching of, comp of um, 21st century skills talks about cognitive skills and talks about social skills. Those being task regulation, learning and knowledge building, participation, perspective taking and social negoci negotiation. Most of those frameworks and OECD uh, and, uh, and PISA being one of those uh, as well, they put students in a specific uh, context that's uh, very well structured and the students are expected to tick several boxes that would show some evidence of social and cognitive skills. That, what SENSE allows us to do is to go beyond that and to understand how those two evolve together. And what we tend to ignore in, in, the, in the current frameworks of, of the assessment, most of the time those environments actually give us, students not in, do not interact with other, uh, with their peers, they interact with agents. And, and Sasha showed us that this might be different from how we interact with, uh, with, uh, with other people. And that's, that's what current frameworks uh, currently ignore. And I think it seems to me based on the current research that sense might be one way of reshaping our thinking, how we measure complex skills and how we use this as, a, as an analytical method. But more importantly, where I see sense as, 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 as going forward is about understanding the nature of interaction between humans and machines. Why this? And, and this is where we link again to the connectivism. Connectivism is actually agnostic to where knowledge resides, whether it's in, in other people, in networks, in humans, machines, doesn't really matter. It, it theorizes that, uh, that, um, that process of knowledge building as, as a network process. So at the moment, as, as the technology becomes more intelligent, it, uh, it, it becomes questionable, can we actually build on the, on the existing theories that we know and, and existing analytical methods to understand how those more intelligent machines actually shape our interactions and how we interact with, the, with each other. And uh, let me just try to wrap up. As I said at the, at the beginning, uh, not very good timing because I still have a lot of questions that need answering, but networks are complex and networks are temporal. And what we, even in, the, in, the, in this first iteration of uh, bringing SNA and ENA together, what we ignored is basically the temporal dimension. What we did was cross-section analysis at the end of the course, but networks evolve, networks develop. How do we, and there is a lot of research recently on, on uh, social network analysis that, that include the temporal aspect. How we combine these two elements in one, when we, when we do SNA and ENA, when we do SENSE, when we combine these two approaches, they both allow for temporal analysis, how we integrate them in, in, into one thing. How do we account for different contextual aspects in, in, understanding, uh, uh, in understanding learning using, the, using SENSE as, as, a, as an approach? What happens with motivation and affect? How we capture for those things? And when we talk about connectivism, we talk about learning in the digital age. What seems to be more uh, cl closer to some of, the, some of the recent development is about knowledge processes. And it's not the digital age, it's more of age of AI for the lack of better word, because we are not learning anymore just as, as we used to. We engage into sense-making, decision-making, all kinds of different processes that lead to knowledge building learning being just one of them, but machines can also learn. What machines might not be able to do is to make sense and interpret those information the way we can. And why AI is just because, um, just because those, all those agents we interact with are becoming more intelligent. So as, as Sasha showed in her study, 
as we progress through to um, descriptive to statistical to being maybe to questioning maybe whether those uh, network models coming from um, theories of social behavior, can we translate them into these new settings? Do we need generative models for sense as well? Can we build generative models uh, based on connectivism that would support research on, on, on uh, that combines sense, uh, social and epistemic network analysis in uh, one model and I'm over time. Sorry about that. I'll just wrap up here. As I said, a lot of questions and I'm happy to take some of your questions. Shreshko, <clears throat> excuse me, Shreshko, thank you very much. That was a, a tour de force. Um, would you mind uh, stopping to sh sharing your screen so we can see everybody in the gallery mode and everybody can give you uh, uh, sure, no applause and, and whatnot? All right. Thank Great you. job. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time maybe to, to sneak in um, one question from the, uh, the audience. I see a lot of applause going on there and I apologize for my dog right now, but that's just the, <laughs> the, the beauty of the, of the world we're living in these days. Um, so I'd like to take uh, a question from the audience if someone would like, otherwise I have one that I'd like to ask too. Um, but does anybody have a question that they wanna put in the chat or to, to ask? Let's see. Otherwise, I can go ahead and, and uh, ask the question real quick. My, my dog might have something to say about it. <laughs> Actually, David, did you, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? And I can, I can mute myself. Well, I always have a question I want to ask. But um, so, Sadechko, one of the things that I'm uh, curious about is how you think about um, the different, <clears throat> excuse me, the differences between SNA and, and ENA, and uh, in particular, right, you've talked, you've made a very convincing case that they're looking at different objects of study, but I'm wondering if you also see them as fundamentally different uh, techniques or mathematical techniques in the sense that could we use e SNA tools to look at the kinds of networks that ENA is looking at and vice versa, or are there, is there something underlying that's different about the structure as well as kind of the intent of the two techniques? Well, what we did before is that we tried to use some of the graph-based methods to analyze uh, to analyze topics emerging from uh, from different discussions. In a way, we tried to do with DNA, but what we were able to to discover from there is how different um, keywords, for example, group together. But we we couldn't actually move beyond that point and understand how those actually topics interact within a specific context, what actually ENA allows us to do. And I think in, in essence, they, they are similar, but in essence, they are different enough just to provide those two complementary perspectives that, that, that we actually need in understanding uh, collaborative learning in, in general. And uh, I think that, that um, definitely, I, I, I don't think that we can just use SNA in the same way we use ENA. And I think that we, there is a need for both methods, definitely. It just short answer. Thank you. All right, my, my dog is quieted down now. Uh, do we have, we might have time for one more question that we could uh, sneak in before we're, we're at time here. Does anybody else have anything that they wanna add or ask a, a Shreshko in the chat or, or um, go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to ask? Yeah, I apologize. I pushed this bit longer than I expected. <laughs> Well, that's okay. You gave us a lot to think about, which was good. I mean, personally, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting is um, thinking about different agents and, you know, what, what are the things that are going to be connected between and what types of things are flowing. Uh, one of the things that, um, you know, I've thought about at times is, is, um, uh, is it access to resources being flowing? There are lots of different networks we could consider, not just necessarily social or epistemic. Yeah. I mean, there's a multi, you can have multimodal multimodal epistemic networks, right? You can have, I liked in one of your social networks where you had different, the edges were different things that were connecting in terms of the quality yeah. of, of how people are connecting to each other. Um, and I think that to me, one of the things that you highlighted pretty well was um, kind of the flexible nature. We, we still have to, I, I liked also that you focused on theory. We're gonna need to be guided by theory in terms of how we are thoughtful in terms of constructing these models, but there's a lot of um, exploration to be done in terms of how these different approaches can be pushed forward into the, into the future. Um, so I don't know, I, that 
at least stuck out to me in your talk. And I don't know if you have any um, things you want to add on that. Yeah, I mean, basically, we there there were a few recent calls from NSF uh, NSF Foundation uh, uh, NSF uh, agency about funding different projects that would focus on understanding how we work with machines. But basically, what seems to be missing there, and that what what came to to this uh, to this uh, SNA research uh, that I tried to, to to tackle a little bit, is also can we just translate the existing approaches that we use to understand social interactions to this new context where we interact with something different. That's not just human in a loop anymore. So now we introduce something that's, that's artificial, but it has more influence on the way we collaborate than it used to be before. You, you, previously, you could take a note, you could ask Siri to uh, do something for you, but now we are going more towards uh, cognitive agents that would take more active role in those interactions. And if we can't translate social behavior, uh, th th what we know from social behavior to online context that we currently have, how can we translate those existing theories of learning or, 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 or understanding knowledge processes into something that brings something artificial that's even more that, that, that's even more active in, 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 in shapes those interactions in, in totally different ways. So that's where, where I see this uh, combination of the, of the methods really, really important and uh, as you said, Brendan, it's not just, it's not going to be one type of networks, one type of, of, of links between the two nodes. There's, there, yeah, there has to be way more. And uh, one way uh, I would like to see um, ENA and SNA going uh, forward is bringing that temporal aspect. That, that's what we missed last time and that's what we should be going for. Uh, I know there is, NA allows for trajectory analysis and how things change over time, but when we integrate two methods, how we do that in a, in, a, in a seamless and efficient way. Yeah, that's great. Well, I just wanna thank you again, Treshko, for a great talk, uh, very interesting. Um, and I'm gonna give a quick plug to someone who's actually heading down to Australia soon to start a, a job at Monash University uh, next week, or next, sorry, Zach. next month, excuse me. <laughs> Zach, Zach Swecky is gonna be talking. Uh, he said, we're all in this together, which I think is a great title right now, Modeling Interdependence in Collaborative Settings. Uh, so please remember to uh, sign up for that and join us. Uh, let's give one more round of applause and thanks to Shreshko for uh, a great webinar. Um, and thank you guys all for being here. And uh, we hope to see you the next time. It was great. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Thanks, Shreshko. Thanks, everybody, for coming.